from the KFH had is quite um, quite interesting. Yeah. Because our, our whole belief system is based on the, the appeasement of an angry God mm. who needed a, a blood sacrifice. And then when you realize, well, the blood wasn't needed. Mm. The whole process of washing and cleansing, the, it wasn't, wasn't needed. <laughs> well, it was, it was needed from our perspective. That's, our that's the reality. We wanted it. We thought it was justice that that would be needed. Therefore, that's what was instituted to satisfy our requirements for blood and to limit the requirements of child sacrifice. Actually, you can't sacrifice children anymore. But if you really do want to sacrifice, then you can use an animal. You know, and I think that's the approach that God took rather than, you know, because the law came through Moses. Well, he, he, uh, he really says that. I think the, the father met Israel where they, where they were at that um, stage of their... Um, yeah. You know, but you very clearly see in the prof in when the, he spoke directly through the prophets that sacrifices and offerings he didn't require. And it says that in Hebrews. You know, and I think this is the sort of the, the struggle people have in reconciling the Old Testament accounts of what God was like with the New Testament accounts through Jesus. But Jesus made it really clear. You know, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You know, and from that perspective, he was the exact representation, um, express image of the Father according to Hebrews, or of God. So whatever we look at the New Old Testament, the Old Covenant things, you have to look through the lens of Jesus. And that's the problem I think people have. They take everything at face value of what the what people recorded without actually realizing the cultural context or even the way Hebrew express things, you know, and they always express what they did from a perspective of what well, God told us to do it, you know, and actually he didn't, you know, what he did allow is the, if they walked independently of him, he allowed them to walk outside his protection and suffer the consequences. And then whenever they turned back to him, he provided them a judge who would bring them back into their land and, and have their inheritance until the next time they decided to go after foreign gods or foreign women or whatever they chose to do independently and the consequences were there. But he didn't bring those consequences on them as a punishment the consequences were a result of them choosing to walk out of his protection. And that's really what happens now. You know, it's like if, if we keep doing things on earth that give the enemy access to bring consequences on us, we suffer the consequences. God didn't punish us. He hadn't got any punishment to give us. And all that sort of gets extrapolated into what Jesus did on the cross was to punish Jesus, God punished Jesus instead of us. Well, there was never any punishment. From God's perspective, Jesus had already been slain before the foundation of the world. So it was already a done deal from his perspective. He could always have a relationship with us, but we didn't feel we could have a relationship with him without certain filling certain requirements. You know? And of course, yeah, God allows us to have those things. I mean, that's, that's the reality. Did he want them to have a king? No, they wanted a king to be like the other nations. You know, and actually the point was they were not supposed to be like the other nations. They were supposed to be a light to the Gentiles and a demonstration to the other nations of what it was like to have God as their king. But they chose, we want, like, we want to be like everybody else. Okay, so, okay, be like everyone else then and see where that leads you. Yeah. No, God even then brings something good out of it in that David comes out of it and Jesus through David, you know, so God looks to bring good out of every stupid thing we ever do, you know, because he loves us so much, you know, but when we do those stupid things and decide to do our own things, he allows us to do it and we choose the consequences of what those actions are. You know, and most of it is all a result of our lack of identity that we don't know 
who we are in relationship with him. So we're looking to get something we've already got. You know, and chase after something using all the different things we do. When we've already got that relationship, God already has established and reconciled us so we can have that relationship. Sadly, most people don't realize. And most people then are not, in a sense, affected by that the way God wants us to be. You know, he wants us to know fully who we are and fully take responsibility for this planet and creation and the universe and bring restoration to it. Uh, but we'll never do that using DIY methods. <laughs> the whole idea of um, cleansing by the blood was actually pagan concepts that we <coughs> Yeah. But um, we still get thrown, thrown to us the um, verse um, where we thought shedding of blood is no, <coughs> no remission of sins. So. Yeah, yeah. But the context of that was in this is what you have required in the old covenant. Now we're in a new covenant and this is not required. Everything is now obsolete. You don't need that anymore. You know, and it really presents Jesus as an offering. He made himself an offering for our death, which was the consequence of our choosing to go our own way, you know, rather than, you know, and that's really where understanding the book of Hebrews and how it's, how it's sort of presented leads you through the journey that takes them into rest where none of these things are, are necessary. You know, relationship doesn't require blood. You know, and what Jesus did was he gave himself to actually our into our death. And therefore he submitted to our punishment of him and our shedding his blood in that sense. You know, is the blood of Jesus a powerful thing? Well, yeah, because it's pure and <laughs> holy and everything else. But I think there's so much I think I was looking at an article the other day by Kay Fairchild, and she's doing a, a series of teachings at the minute on, you know, why blood is not necessary and what the blood is for and what it does accomplish. Um, and I think a lot of these things are now open for God to bring a fresh revelation to us from a relational perspective, from a heavenly perspective, and not just from a natural earthly perspective. Because none of it is going to come through an earthly perspective. It, it needs to come out of heaven. And, you know, what happened is God, yes, when the blood was shed, that blood was sprinkled on all the objects in heaven to bring them back out of the enemy's sort of defilement into the ability for the sons of God to, to access now. And so the blood was used. You know, not just, but not in the way that we think it was used. You know, but there's a lot more, I think, that God's going to unveil in all that stuff. And um, if we're willing to follow the journey and not get spooked by the potential hassle and criticism and judgment that may come from our fellow brothers and sisters who are, you know, still... You know, insistent on penal substitution atonement and all those doctrinal positions and don't like you know the fact that you know we don't see eye to eye but they're quite entitled to their opinion and they're quite entitled to continue in their view if they want to do that you know, um, but I'm not and you know, well I can because you know of the revelation that I've received what God has shown me what God has said to me I can't go back on that and go back to some other man-made uh, doctrinal position, which God clearly has told me isn't correct. So bless them who want to stay in that. You know, I mean, someone said to me, you know, you, you're trying to remove the cornerstone of our faith, you know? And I thought, well, isn't Jesus supposed to be the cornerstone of our faith? Are we not supposed to build on any other foundation than him? Um, which I think is the truth. And people have made doctrines the cornerstone of their faith, whatever they are, rather than Jesus as a person. And he is all we need 
you know, we need to build into him the, the living word of God, the word of God. So, yes, I, I've had, you know, some interesting the last few weeks. I've done a couple of sessions on slaying the sacred cow of inerrancy and, and infallibility of the Bible, <laughs> which, of course, created a number of questions. You know, but the Bible itself doesn't say that it's that, you know, and is it inspired? Well, the bits of it that are inspired are inspired. Obviously, the things God said, Jesus said, are inspired. The writers were inspired, but not everything that they've recorded was inspired. They recorded warts and all uh, versions of what people said and their opinions and their behavior and everything else. Did God inspire their behavior? No. Did he inspire their opinions? No. So there's sort of what did he inspire? Well, he inspired people to write and record. But what they wrote and recorded is not necessarily inspired because it's people, you know, and it was written, of course, through people who can only prophesy in part. It wasn't dictated. You know, and some of it's poetry and some of it's prose and some of it's stories. I mean, it's designed to point us to Jesus, the living word. You know, and I love the bit in John 5, I think, where Jesus says, You've been searching the scriptures, trying to find me. And here I am. And you don't recognize me because you're looking through the filters of what your expectation is. And I don't meet up to your expectations of what you are expecting. Therefore, you've rejected me effectively. Which I think people are still searching the scriptures, trying to find God when he's in them at work, trying to reveal himself. They're just looking in the wrong place. You know, and we've used the Bible to try and convince people that God is true and God is this. Well, God can do that himself if we give him the opportunity. You know, we've used the Bible to try and prove that the Bible is true, then God is true to people who don't believe that the Bible's true, which is a futile exercise. Let's introduce God as in them, at work in them, because he loves them and wants a relationship with them. And that encounter will totally unveil the truth not trying to convince them through a book that a lot of people today don't even accept is inspired by god so why would we try and use it to prove something it just doesn't work we need to introduce people to a living personal relationship with a living god who's already at work in their lives that's what jesus was saying you don't go searching through your scriptures and your ideas to find me when I'm already here. You know, and he, he said, you know, on the day of his resurrection, on that day, you will know that I'm now in you and you're in me. And that's the truth. And that's what the message we have of reconciliation, that God has already reconciled the cosmos to himself. And he's given this, this message, this word of reconciliation to say, Hey, wake up realize what god's already done for you realize who god already is in you you know when paul sort of said in in galatians he records his view of the damascus road it was that god revealed jesus in him not around him in a light external to him but he that light revealed that jesus was already in him and he had been resisting kicking against what Jesus wanted to do, which was to disciple him as, as a son, kicking against it all that time by sticking to their old religion. You know? And as soon as he realized that, it was like, whoa, woe is me. You know? <laughs> it's like, go show me the truth now, then. And he, of course, he went, you know, not to Jerusalem to get truth from the disciples, but he went direct to Jesus and spent time in the desert where he was taught you know directly by the holy spirit and then taken to heaven and shown even more things and then he then starts to reveal those things in letters to help the churches understand their identity and the revelation of that so yeah it's an interesting journey for sure <laughs> anyway let's throw it open anyone else got anything they want to to talk about or ask if you've got your hand up there agnes 
Yeah. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Um. I was just. Uh, I was just led to listen to teachings by um, Baxter Kruger. I don't oh, know. Oh yeah, you know. Baxter is awesome. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I, I was like, I was t- totally blown away. And I was thinking, has Mike been listening to Buster Kruger? Because <laughs> he just speaks the same, same thing. And he talks about hell being in God. And I'm like, this is so perfect for me. It helped me shift so many mindsets that I had. And he just totally unlocked things in me. And it was so amazing. And he goes on to talk so deeply, you know, about it and... Um, I had a really interesting encounter myself, you know, you know, dealing with mindsets. And um, I looked at this picture that Kiana, uh, Kiana did of Jesus. And it's kind of like has the hair, you know, kind of like going round and the back. And, but my image of Jesus has always been the one who has the split hair in the middle and the hair coming down. And I'm looking at this picture and I'm like, no, I would rather have you with the hair split like that and coming down the shoulders. I'm like, that's the one I want. <laughs> no, this one. And he's just thinking, look at you, like, do I have to be like that all my life? Don't I get it cut? <laughs> and I was just laughing and laughing at myself, like, wow. Our minds is <laughs> like, oh, it's like your heart is so hardened. I'm like, no, I like the Jesus with the hair split in the middle coming down the shoulders. Because that's the one that I grew up with. And I'm like, oh, it was really, really interesting. Mm. I, I imagine that one was painted by someone who'd never met him face to face. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> and uh, Akiana was. Yeah, I, met him. I, I mean, it's such, there's a really interesting YouTube story of her journey with that picture and the Prince of Peace picture. Because yeah. when you look at the Prince of Peace, half of the face is in shadow. And she she couldn't see the full picture of his face. And she was on a journey, I think, 15, 16 years or something. Yeah, that's and the one I watched. Yeah. she then saw him face to face yeah. in the light and yeah. saw more. Yeah. And I think that's the picture of where, where we all are. Uh-huh. That's we've the one that I saw. His face and we've not been able to see everything fully. Yeah. And now that light is beginning to shine and reveal the true nature of his face and the true yeah. nature of his character. Yeah. And it's being unveiled to us. Yeah. I've resisted that picture for so long. I'm like, no, I- I'd rather go with the one, you know, with the split hair and oh, <laughs> there's always something. So, you know, well, at the end of the day, you just got to look, see what you see. You know? <laughs> Jesus will engage you the way you need to engage him. Yeah. You know? When I engaged heaven, that's what I saw before I ever saw the picture. It was only later that I saw that picture that, um, and so wow, that's him. And I remember then seeing that film, Heaven is Real, and the little boy. Because yeah. they kept asking him, well, what does Jesus look like? And then she, he saw that picture, and he did the same thing. That's him. That's what uh, he looks like. Yeah. And, you know, for me, that's what he did look like before I ever saw the picture. That wow. was how I engaged with them. But, you know, he, he, he'll, he'll engage with us in, in any way that can, so we can experience him. But I think it's always going to be an unveiling and an unfolding picture that reveals more, not just what he looks like, but what that actually represents in terms of the nature and character, the very essence of God and love. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then yesterday he told me that, um, you love your life, like you need to let go of your life. And I was like, well, I thought I needed to keep my life so you could use it. No, he said, you need to lose it. (laughs) It was so funny. Yeah. So, okay. Well, I think, yeah, that's, that's again, you know, he, (laughs) he wants to keep his life. will lose it. (laughs) He surrenders his life. will gain it. Yeah. And I think that was the thing. What does it profit a man? if he gets the whole world, but actually loses his soul. Yeah. I think the key word there was, you know, let's not try and do things in our own strength, but let's embrace and surrender to him. Yeah. Um, and he'll give us the fullness of life, you know, but let's stop trying to do it our own way. Yeah. Cause and, I thought I needed to preserve it, to keep it so he can use it. It's like, no, you've got to give it to me. So whether you die or you don't die, it doesn't really matter. 
you surrendered it. I was like, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when we're looking at coming into our sonship and embracing our sonship, you know, you aren't going to be enthroned unless there's a succession that takes place. You know, the, the queen didn't take the throne until the king died. Yeah, the king died until she, and then she then took the throne. The previous king abdicated for someone else to take the throne. And if we think of the throne of our own life and ruling our own life, to, to begin to occupy the thrones and authority of heaven, you have to abdicate. You have to abdicate the throne of your life. You have to get off it and you have to invite God on it. And when he is on the throne in our life, then heaven recognizes our position to be on the thrones in heaven. And it doesn't work. Even though we have those thrones there, there's a requirement of succession before there's an, an enthronement that needs to take place. And that is surrender. I surrender the rule of my life to you. And I'm going to stop trying to figure it out and do it myself. Yeah, you know, we've already been crucified with Christ. So we've already died from that perspective. So we just need to surrender to that death. It's like, not that we have to die again. We've already died, but we have to surrender and embrace that and experience it so that we can be enthroned in heaven. You know, and so many people want to be enthroned in heaven, but they don't want to go through the surrender or, and succession abdication of the throne of their own lives and it will never work heaven won't recognize our authority if they don't see god on the throne of our lives and of course we're in him so he's teaching us to rule from being in him in that place of authority in him because uh, we're included in him in that way thank you so much indeed Okay, anyone else got anything you want to ask or talk about? Hi, Mike. Hi, Jan. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I was just also thinking of a guy called Bruce Warchope. I don't know if you've come across him at all. No. no. Um, like Agnes was saying, it, it, he might interest you because he's someone else who's kind of um, taken an axe to certain things like separation from God, mm. um, dualism, and all this kind of thing, mm. um, doctrines that we, we've grown up with and we just accept, you know, we tend to think that that's actually in the Bible. Mm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, he, he's actually a doctor, uh, there's quite a few YouTube videos and he came across a lot of um, mentally ill born again Christians and he right. he wanted to know why and um, he saw that they were effectively split personality you know because a lot of them thought of themselves as you know I have a good side and a bad side right. and uh, I must earn my brownie points and mm. all this kind of thing um, yeah, and he's, yeah it's, it, it might interest you because... Okay. So how do you spell his name? Uh, I, I believe it's Bruce, I think it's W-A-U-C-H-O-P-E. Oh, okay, yeah, watch him. Okay, yeah, I'll have a look. I mean, I, do, I like Baxter Kruger. I mean, I've not listened to a lot of his stuff. I've read, you know, his book on um, you know, The Shack Revisited and his take on the theology of the shack, which I really enjoyed. Um, and I, I think he's, he's great. He's a storyteller. He's someone who can connect. He's very relational. And a lot of, a lot of this revelation is coming through many sources. You know, it's not just one source that's coming with fresh revelation of the nature and character of God and inclusion and all these things. It's many, many sources. And I think that, shows that God is trying to get the message out to people in different streams and different perspectives 
and they'll receive it from somebody in one perspective and someone else will receive it from someone in another stream. And so God is revealing this across the streams, you know, and I think some, you know, some people will listen to Nancy Cohen and some people won't listen to Nancy Cohen, but they may well listen to Braxter Kruger. So I think that's the great thing or William Paul Young or others who are, you know, carrying this message in this heart. Um, the key is, I think, to be open continually for progressive revelation. You know, Jesus said uh, to his disciples, look, I've got lots of things I want to teach you, but you can't bear them yet. And when were they able to bear them? You know, I don't think they were able to bear everything that we can bear today. And I think we're in a place where God can speak to us in terms what he couldn't possibly have spoken to the disciples. And he expressed that to Nicodemus. You know, I'm trying to tell you of heavenly things using some earthly illustrations and you don't get it. How are you going to get the heavenly things that don't have earthly illustrations? Well, I think some of the heavenly things now do have earthly expressions through quantum physics and other perspectives that we now, when we hear those things, can connect them to you know, what Jesus was always trying to want to say, to reveal how heaven works and how creation works and how all this stuff is connected together and you know, and quantum entanglement and quantum tunneling and quantum observation and the ability to create reality, you know, all those things Jesus was wanting to release and reveal, but couldn't. You know, Paul, when he went into the heavens, found some things inexpressible. Not that he didn't have permission to say, he just didn't have the words. You know, a first century man was never going to be able to describe words of quantum physics. So he used other ways of saying it, you know, like, things everything that we see has come from that which isn't seen you know the invisible i mean that is a quantum physics statement but obviously couldn't be expressed in quantum physics terms at that time but now can and so i think we are in a stage where revelation is being unveiled to us because jesus is able to uh, reveal things that we can now bear that we couldn't then and some and some of it's taken you know this long to bear it you know, and the only people who were able to receive some of these things in mysteries were the mystics who gave themselves to it and, of course, got persecuted by the you know, existing church of their day um, because they were telling people things that went against the church. You know, and so all the way through, God has had those who have been willing to listen. Uh, but now the way in which we can express what he's showing us has increased. You know, as understanding has increased, you know, uh, and I think there's probably way, way, way more that God wants to reveal and unveil to us that maybe we can't yet bear. But hopefully we will continue the journey and we'll be able to bear the things he wants to reveal so that we can have those experiences ourselves of, of a revelation of that truth. You know, some people, if you talk about progressive revelation to you know, evangelicals, they'll just, you know, you know dismiss. You know, I remember I was with a group of leaders once and uh, I was talking in, we were just talking about general things and, and I mentioned progressive revelation. It was almost like the look on their face was one of horror as if I would had said the F word or something. And it was just like, you know, and all I was saying is, well, God is, is revealing things to us that we didn't know yesterday. And they were like, no, everything's already been revealed. Hmm. You know, I'm like, well, have you not believed something differently now than you did 10 years ago? Well, yeah, but that's different. He's just revealing what's already been revealed. As well, it's just semantics and splitting hairs. If you don't know something and God is going to reveal it to you, then it's been progressively revealed. You didn't know it before. So what's the problem? But they're stuck in this rigid the Bible is written, it is completely fixed and there's nothing can be added or taken away because of course they read revelation and because the book of revelation, which is the last book it's in the recorded Bible says you can't take away or add. And they apply that to the whole book. 
which obviously isn't true because God is to, continuing to speak to us things which aren't in the book. You know, and then you had the same thing that was said to in the law in Deuteronomy where it says, you know, if you add to this, blah, 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 blah. Well, Jesus added to it, as did the prophets and everybody else. You know, so, you know, we've got to be careful that we just don't get stuck. And we're open to continually for the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, who Jesus did promise us. He didn't really promise us a book as a manual. And I think if he was really intending us to have a book, I think he might have told his disciples to look out for one or to write one. But he didn't. He actually promised us the spirit to live in us who would reveal the truth, all the truth to us. And we have the spirit living in us. And that's who we should be looking for, for our source of revelation. And primarily, I don't believe God wants to speak to us through a book. You know, he wants to speak to us in face-to-face -face relationship. Many people have limited him speaking to them to a book and have missed out on the way God can speak outside of that book to us in ways, you know, which an infinite God, you know, can never be contained within a book. It couldn't, it couldn't even contain the works of Jesus within the book as the book itself says <laughs> in John. Um, so I think we're in a stage where revelation is open, we're, we're having increased revelation. And it's awesome that many people across many streams are carrying some of that revelation that shows we need to be able to draw from all the different streams and not be stuck in one. Because I think God will never restrict what he's saying to one particular stream because they'll become elitist we have the truth and everyone else doesn't you know so god will choose some of the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and he'll do that to us if we think we're wise in our own eyes um, you know which is why you know i was talking to justin abraham about this and he was saying how important cross-pollination is we need to draw from what God is revealing, whatever stream he's revealing it in and engage it so that we can receive the fullness and embrace that fullness rather than being restricted to, well, these are our people and we stick to them, you know, and it's great having people who bring revelation like Ian Clayton and others. Awesome. But actually let's not miss something that comes from a source which we may not normally receive from because God may well just surprise us with revelation that comes from other sources. So, so I, I love the, I love being eclectic. You know, you can chew the grapes and spit out the pips rather than, Ooh, that's not right. So I'm rejecting everything that that person says. And that is the old, that's the old way. That's the old way it's been. God is wanting to renew us and bring us out of the old into the new where we're open to receive revelation from whatever source it comes, whether that be a writing from somewhere else, whether that be someone bringing a message, whether that's directly from him himself, we've got to be open to receive it, you know, and God sometimes will knock us down a little peg or two and test us whether we're willing to receive from sources, which, are not actually what we would con convince of all true. And I think the same would be, you know, me, I've read, a, I've read quantum physics books that I would totally disagree with in terms of their perspective and their conclusions, but I totally accept the absolute truth that's in it. And we can receive the truth and not be afraid of being tainted by maybe some false conclusions that people make. Yeah. So there's Jesus is the truth and where truth is, Jesus has inspired it from whatever source that might be. And I think he's hidden truth within so many different pathways so that people on those pathways can realize when they encounter the truth that they can change paths and they can follow him from that pathway you know and i and I, I love the the quote in the shack where jesus was talking to mac and 
Max says, well, I guess, you know, all roads lead to you. And Jesus says, well, no, most roads don't lead anywhere, but I'll travel on all of them to reach you. You know, and I think that really encapsulates the heart of God and the love of God and his desire to reach us wherever we are, which is awesome. Okay, Agnes, you got your hand up there again. I just wanted to understand uh, what happens to your soul or your spirit when you meditate on scripture? What happens? When you make declarations, what happens around you? Well, I, I'm not really sure that those are the best ways of engaging God. They are a part of people's journey. So when I would, you know, years ago, I would try and confess the word of God to believe it, memorize it, and hope that it would change me. It didn't, you know, because it didn't work that way. Just confessing something that the Bible says does not make it true for me. It's already true. You know, and I try to renew my mind by using scripture to change my mind, whereas actually I need a person and a relationship to change my mind because it's relational you know does is the is the bible and the stories in the bible and some of those bible verses opportunities to use them as a doorway into the experience yes so you know revelation 320 and you know behold i stand at the door and revelation 4 1 you know there's a door standing open and those are all things that we can say, hey, great, I can enter into that. But then we've got to go into it and experience. So I would say that the word of God and meditating the word of God should be seen as a doorway into something which is a revealing of the living word of God and experiencing him, not just limiting it to words in a book. Um, so, yes, you can meditate. You can confess scripture, whether it will do any good, I don't know. You know, I, I guess it ain't going to do any harm unless you think by meditate or by confessing scripture, you're going to change something. You know, you, we need to know the truth and the truth is a person and knowing the person will bring the change. That's what Jesus said. If you want freedom, you know, you need to know the truth because the truth that you know will set you free. And it wasn't talking about intellectual understanding or memorizing or even positive confession. It was talking about engaging in first face-to-face -face relationship with Jesus, the truth. And then our life can be transformed. We will get a fullness of abundant life in engaging the living word of God, the truth, rather than trying to get the Bible to change us. The Bible can't change us. Only Jesus can change us. You know, and we've tried to use techniques that use the Bible to change us. You know, I tried to renew my mind so that my mind would think like the Bible. Well, I don't want to think like the Bible. I want to think like Jesus. I have the mind of Christ, not the mind of the Bible. So although it can be helpful initially to engage through that media as a doorway we need to be careful we don't limit ourselves to that and only can access when we do something through the bible rather than actually engaging jesus so meditation is a really good thing but it's there to point us to the living relationship with jesus not a substitute We've got to be careful that the Bible does not become a mediator between God and man, which I think it's become in the evangelical world. And I think God wants to remove all mediators. Now, I've said this before, but I don't think we should have ever had a full finished Bible bound. We should have had a ring binder that God could have continued to add to because it's open and not closed. The canon of scripture, even if I, believe in that term it should never have been closed it should have been open and then the writings that of those that god spoke to through the ages would have been part of it and those books that got thrown out because they didn't think people were up to it will be included in it 
and you know the thousand years where no one could read it for themselves wouldn't have happened you know and but it did and now we're trying to recover um, this in a sense that we can engage a living person and it isn't just about a book as much as there's amazing truth in that book but a lot of that truth has to be has to be engaged through the spirit all of it does if you don't engage it in the spirit it's a dead letter which will kill and put you into bondage and fear and that dead letter will kill you according to corinthians no, i'm not saying it will physically kill you although it could you know i mean it did kill all those martyrs who uh, tried to stand up for it and got killed i guess um but the reality is you know god wants us to experience him and the living relationship with him that the book points to and let's not get stuck in the signpost but where the signpost is pointing to that's the important thing with engaging the word Okay, anything else? Anyone else got anything they want to talk about? Any exciting things God's sharing with you? I had an ex uh, interesting experience uh, that last week. Um, Monday, I um, had to get somewhere at uh, 9 and uh, left home at 7.30. Hmm. Uh, I got there exactly at 9. So on Tuesdays, I decided to, to shift time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, right. So I left home the same 7.30, and um, I got there about almost 40 minutes earlier. So <laughs> no way I could have done it. Um, normally, it takes an hour and a half, and uh, hmm. quite surprised about that. Awesome. So what did you do to facilitate that? I just said, uh, well, I'm stepping into rich time. Okay. Yeah. I heard uh, Justin teaching that. So yeah. I'll, uh, I'll just step into rich time. So I opened my door and I uh, went out and said, oh, I'm stepping into rich time. And um, <laughs> that was it. Yeah. Well, I think that's the things we've got to start choosing to do and believing that we have the power to create realities by choosing those things which are impossible from the natural perspective, but not impossible from the spiritual one and i think god does want us to practice and learn how to do it and be effective because we're going to need to do it in the future you know and time miracles and time things awesome but there's a way more you know let's do some creative things as well let's start to create things that don't exist yet in this realm by drawing them out of that spiritual realm so they manifest in this realm and start using spiritual material to manifest things not physical so when we're going to need, I don't know, let's say we're creating an embassy of heaven on earth and we need you know, 500 houses for people to live in. Well, we don't need to approach a builder. We just need to be able to choose to create those things ourselves because Jesus gave us the model for it. You know, we could actually turn water into wine. Well, why can't we turn wood into gold? Or why can't we turn nothing into something? Because it isn't nothing. It's spiritual material that needs to manifest as spiritual mater physical material. So we can call out of that quantum realm, out of the spiritual realm, the manifestation of what we have created there by calling it the be not as if it is, so that those 500 houses will m materialize from the spiritual realm into the physical one. And we won't have to build them. Those, I think, are the type of dynamics that God is wanting us to practice now so that we're able to do that in the future. Uh, and time things are the beginning of that, to go way beyond any limitation that's placed on us so that we can begin to express the creativity of sonship so creation will respond to us as we take our place you know, and know our identity and outwork it. So, yeah, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Kat Kera saw, um, I think it's around um, 2050 or something like that, where we would speak um, 
or buildings into existence, creating a yeah. I mean, I'm 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 not convinced on the future being fixed, but I do believe that we can engage the heart of God to see His heart for the future, and that manifestation that we see, then we can begin to respond to create. So I'm not. I don't believe that the future is fixed. So do I believe Ian Clayton or anyone else went to the future? I'm not convinced of that, but I am convinced that what they've seen is God's version of the future that he wants us to embrace. Or sometimes you can see the enemy's thing of the future, which we should be resisting. And I think there's a view of here is what someone is trying to have in the future rather than it already existing. It's like we get to be creating it. And when we engage eternity outside of time and space in the constant now, you know, and that, that is, you know, scientific fact. I mean, when you look at some of the quantum things about now and, you know, approaching the speed of light, everything is now. Um, and, you know, Einstein's relativity theory and all that stuff, you know, it, it really does indicate that God is both outside and inside of time. And for him, everything outside of time is now, but he's chosen to operate inside of time, which is why sometimes it says he can be surprised because he's choosing. And there is this thing of a moment and many moments. I mean, it's a really interesting. I mean, I'll do some teaching on it one day uh, on, on terms of how time works in terms of, you know, outside of time and space and within time and space and how the moments of within time are connected to that which is outside of time. Um, but we have access to it. We have access to the eternal heart of God and we have access to his mind and we have access to his thoughts and we have access to his desire. And when we are moved by that desire, that desire can move us to be creative sons to see that express. So is God's desire that in 2057, these things are, are yes, absolutely that we will be able to speak and see manifestations and we will be able to do other things maybe and some of it is how that gets out worked is through us because he's given us the responsibility to be part of co-airship of creation and therefore be part of the creation of it and every time we make a decision we are either agreeing or disagreeing with God's view of the future. And if we're intimate enough with the Father, then our heart is moved to be in agreement with his heart. But I don't think it's such a fixed, rigid thing that our creativity is not part of it. Otherwise, it would just be fate. Well, it's already happening, so we might as well wait for it to happen. Well, no, he's, he's, our involvement in it is part of it happening. Therefore, we need to be in agreement and cooperation with it so that it will manifest and we can make decisions and choices which don't align ourselves to it. And then God's got to work something good to bring around something. We'll bring it back on track, which, which is what he does all the time from all our decisions that we make, which are, some of them are not too smart. You know? And he even uses those things we've set in the story to still bring about his eventual desire but we have to learn to cooperate with that, I think, more and more creatively and deliberately uh, to be those who create the future and it becomes history because we have chosen to align ourselves with God's purpose in it all rather than not. You know, and it's our choice, which is the key. You know, I used to talk quite a lot about free will. I don't really believe in free will from the perspective of we're influenced by something. So is our will totally uninfluenced by something? No. It's either influenced by what we've seen, what we've heard, what we've been told, what God tells us. Our choice is what we have. We have the ability to choose. And let's make sure we make choices based on the influence of the Holy Spirit in our lives rather than the influence of anything else. And I think free will from a perspective of we can just do whatever we want 
we're influenced by something that will enable us to choose to do something or not. Um, and I think our choices is the key. And we have a choice gate within our soul. You know, one of those gates is called choice. And we need to operate out of worship, which is I'm agreeing and surrendering to God's choice so that now my choices are aligned to his. And then things will begin to manifest out of heaven into the earth because we've chosen to align ourselves and are part of the process of it happening. You know, we can't just sit back and wait for Jesus to do it. You know, he is going to do it with us in relationship, but we get to be sons who have that responsibility to bring creation into the freedom of the glory of our sonship. You know, not just sort of, we're not just the tea boys in the, in the process. You know. And there are the double slit experiment where where we um where waves that are observed are changing the particles just by um, observation. Um yeah. if we can change them the particles we should be able to arrange those particles into any um anything we want to. Absolutely. It's just a matter of actually being able to focus that at those particles to see those particles begin to come together which is really what the spirit did when he was hovering over the waters, bringing things into vibrational frequency and using the strings that are the building blocks of every particle. And if we connect to the vibrational strings of energy, which are the grace of God, his divine enabling power that holds everything together and is vibrating within the fabric of everything that exists, because there is no empty space. You know, and I think that has been proven now, uh, again, you know, by scientific discovery, that we will realize that we have the authority to call those strings of energy to manifest into particles that will come together to form matter. You know, so the potential possibilities of light energy needs to manifest by our conscious decisions into physical matter and then even that physical matter can change form if we realign the vibrational frequency of the particles into something else which is what jesus did you know and he, he clearly demonstrated that and he told us to do the things that he did so we have a mandate to transform stuff from one map area of matter through energy conscious energy into another because we apply our conscious energy to the vibration of the matter and it will change its vibrational frequency into something else but we've got to learn to focus it and that's what we've got to practice doing and by practicing engaging time or changing things and doing that's all part of it you know and i think we've got to have our mind expanded to go beyond the limitations that has been put on us by the world and by religion and be free to be really fully manifested sons in the earth. Yeah. So something interesting um, came out last week there. Um, you know, sometimes when people take photographs in uh, and they see like a ghost in the background or I just see uh, Henry VIII or somebody <laughs> in the back of the photograph. Um, when now they're wondering whether it could be that uh, there's a wrinkle in the time and space fabric and we are actually photographing a bit of the past. Since everything is in the now, it could be that the camera is picking up uh, something that uh, is still there but was 200 years ago. <laughs> it's possible because memory is stored within the fabric of everything. And therefore a building or a room has stored within its fabric, everything that was said and everything that was done. And maybe some of those things are being picked up. I don't know. It's possible. It's certainly possible. Um, you know, I mean, I, I've got some pictures that we took here of some of our meetings in which things were manifested on those pictures, which weren't visible to the natural eye in the room. And some of those were power orbs and different things that were in the room, which, you know, 
you couldn't see with your naked eye and they weren't there the next day because i went back with the same camera with the same conditions and tried taking the same pictures and they weren't there you know so you know i think there are things that seemingly get picked up i remember i was in phoenix and we were doing a live stream and we were doing some way out wacky worship and um people started phoning in saying can you see what's going on and on the actual on the video which i mean i've got a copy of it um there were angels light really buzzing around not just sort of moving across the screen but actually moving in and out and around i mean it was you know clearly a supernatural manifestation uh, which was caught on video yeah and you can st you can see I and mean, lots of them i friend of mine in um in seattle area um she she has a picture of her cat actually sort of doing this at like balls of light and she's because she caught it on film and the cat picked it up was sensitive to this to it and actually you can see it these balls of light are moving and the cat is trying to trying to touch them with his paw <laughs> it's, it's awesome so then we're seeing it but those things are there and you know we've just got to start learning to tune in with our natural eyes to see those things because we're tuning into wavelengths um, that we once could see or mankind could see before the abilities were lost and now god is restoring those abilities so we can begin to connect to wavelengths of electromagnetic energy which are not normally visible but our spirit can engage it and see it um, so that we can see what's going on we're available to engage with what's going on so, yeah okay all right um okay patrick yeah you've got your hand up there i'm uh, just thinking you know given that the earth is remote more than half the earth is underwater mm. um is cleansing the land under the sea is that the same as cleansing the dry land would you say uh well if if everything is going to be restored to god's original intention then i believe that there will be a restoration of land mass back to its original condition and i think some of that will be recovering stuff which is under the sea now um, and i think there are a lot of people talk about water spirits and obviously leviathan and various things and i've seen a few of those things and i think there is a sense where that is something which i believe we need to start operating in areas of authority in also the tectonic plates um you know where there are spiritual forces in ruling over those tectonic plates where we should be and therefore some of the tension between the tectonic plates which produces earthquakes and volcanic eruptions and things we're there to bring peace and to remove the tension between those things um, therefore we need to rule those tectonic plates and i've seen the thrones in the th affairs of the nation's house in in heaven where those thrones are being are prepared for people to take them it's just people aren't taking their position there yet whether they're mature enough to do it i don't know but it will mean dispossessing the enemy's activity and i know ian claim talks about the nine giant races and each one of them having taken charge of a tectonic plate um there are you know a few sub plates and a few other bits and pieces but i do believe that god wants us to take it back and so someone is gonna accept the mandate and be enthroned because we don't want to leave it unoccupied yeah you know we don't want to do any dealing with thrones and principalities and powers and rulers and everything else and leaving it unoccupied because jesus said what happens when you leave something unoccupied you get seven worse coming back to take possession of it so if we're going to deal with some of these things we've got to make sure that there are those who are ready to take their place and be seated in authority and administrate that which is a big responsibility you know to administrate peace into the fabric of the earth so that it eventually actually brings all the land masses back together so that will mess up the national boundaries of people 
but it will actually mean all the families of the earth can be once again one and not separated by the sea mm. because there was no no in god there was no desire for separation man chose to separate because he wanted to make a name for himself uh, and as a result of that separation took place uh, and all the nations have come out of that separation so yes i think there is a sense where there is stuff to be reclaimed and things under the sea and not just to be cleansed but to be ruled and to be administrated and to be governed to bring the kingdom and increase the ca kingdom capacity um, so that we'll start to see peace manifest within the very physical planet not just within people you know, and you've obviously got promises like the lion lying down with the lamb and you know yeah weapons being turned into into implements of farming you know and i think those are promises for restoration you know we need to look to that you know, things do not have to get worse and worse they've already been worse they're getting better you know, and people will say, no, there can't be better. Well, go back to 150, 200 years and look at the condition that children were living in. We think today that children are in poverty. Go back 200 years and see what they were living in then. Is it perfect now? No, it isn't. But it's better than what it was then. We're not putting ch children up chimneys, yeah. down mines yeah. when they were eight or nine. You know, things have progressed. Yeah. The kingdom has had an influence in the world. Mm. By and large, things are better than they've been. Because of communication and the way the communication system is used, it highlights the negative all the time. You know, how many good news stories do you get in the papers that are on the news? It's all bad. They're all reporting on the bad. Well, yeah. if you didn't hear any of that, you would only be reporting on what's happening in your own life. And actually, most people's lives are better than they've been before. You know, so we need to see, I think, a, a change in how we perceive. You know, Jesus started off with 12 disciples and 500 people. And now we've got, you know, at least who profess to know him, over a billion people. You know, so it, it has sort of begun to infiltrate and fill the earth. And, you know, that little bit of leaven is begin to leaven the whole lump. It's just not in such a way that we would really like it to yet but we've got to act that's why we've got to embrace the fullness of our sonship so we can actually influence these things in a in a fuller way you know was it the the affairs of the nations of the place in heaven that you mentioned yeah there's one of the chancellor's houses is called the affairs of the nations and there's a lot of activity there that's the house that i saw more activity in than any other house um, because I think people's desire is being stirred to bring transformation, to bring change to their lives, their area, their region, their city, their country. Um, I think what we've got to be careful is that we don't do it on nationalistic lines, but on God's desire to bless all the families of the earth, which is people, not national boundaries and uh, imperialism or any other type of government which is outside of God's kingdom which is a kingdom of peace uh -huh. and all you'll find all the nations that are not operating in that kingdom of peace are causing conflict you know and it's the conflict between the nations and their fear of boundaries and borders and maintaining what they've got which is causing all the conflict you know we've got to get beyond that into bringing blessing we're there to bless all the families of the earth, regardless of where they live. Yeah. Not, well, we're only going to bless our own. And you get all that with the, you know, the issues of immigration and all that stuff. It's just like Brexit. We don't want all these people coming. Well, in, aren't they part of the families of the earth? And don't we want to bless them? And you had the other day, uh, this sort of uh, ship that was coming from somewhere that wanted to get off in, in Italy and they wouldn't let them dock. And then they yeah. were trying to go in Malta and Malta turned them away. And eventually Spain took them. Yeah. And I expect Spain to be blessed by that. I don't want them to win the world cup though. So it's nice. Yeah. You know. But you know, but I believe they will be because they're demonstrating the heart of God. 
yeah. in accepting people from other families of the earth who need help rather than rejecting them out of fear. We don't want them here. You know, not in my backyard. You know, and that attitude is totally contradictory to the very tenets of the kingdom based in love. You know, uh, and we've got to be very careful that we do not operate in the same prevailing attitudes, but we demonstrate a different attitude one of acceptance and one of love. You know, and I believe God will honor places that do that. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. Okay. Ooh, right, I better leave it there. I've got to 